Well, I invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 14, and we have some unfinished business to take care of. Um, We began looking at this section that deals with the cost of discipleship, which begins in verse 25 and it extends to verse 35, and we have already met together for two sessions to work our way all the way down to what would be verse 34. And so tonight, I want us to look at verses 34 and 35, as I trust we will bring to conclusion uh, our very brief uh, series on these verses. Again, it is the cost of discipleship, and tonight is part three. I believe that it would be appropriate to begin by reading the passage beginning in verse 25, and I'm sure you will give most careful attention uh, to the reading of the Word. I would urge you to follow along in your own Bible. You might even want to have a pen in hand and underline in your own Bible key words um, that become very um, strategic in your mind as we look at these verses. I'll just let you know what's underlined in my Bible. Uh, It's the last word in verse 26, the last word in verse 27, and near the middle of verse 33, I've underlined the word disciple those three times as it appears in this text, so that visually, even when I look at my Bible, I see what is primary, what is dominant. This is all about discipleship. This is all about what a disciple of Jesus Christ is. So beginning in verse 25, now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he, ha- whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What we learn from these verses by our Lord is that discipleship is serious business. If we are not true disciples, then we really cannot follow Christ and we cannot come after Christ. If we are not true disciples, then we cannot begin to build and we will certainly, or we can begin to build but not be able to finish A disciple is a learner, one who attaches himself to Christ by faith and comes under the authority of his teaching. And more than that, a disciple is a follower of Christ, not just a learner, but a follower. That is to say, he or she is one who has chosen to put into daily practice the truths taught by Christ. The teaching of Christ is the rudder of a disciple's life, like the rudder of a ship that directs them in their character, 
their choices, their conversations, and their conduct. The word disciple was the most common name in New Testament times for followers of Jesus Christ. When you take the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and add the book of Acts, the number of times that the word disciple is used is 264 times. It far overshadows any other name or description that would be used for one who is a believer in Christ or a follower of Christ. Jesus was never interested in mere decisions, quote-unquote. He wanted disciples. He did not want mere crowds. He wanted commitment. And Jesus was never concerned about the breadth of his ministry, but the depth of it. And so the point of these verses is much needed to be heard today as we live in a day in which so many are concerned about the breadth of the ministry. The focus here is on the cost of discipleship, and that cost is a high cost. It will cost us everything to be a follower of Christ. It will cost us the right to control our own lives. It will cost us the right to live how we want and where we want. In these verses, it is very clear that a disciple is one who has signed their life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus speaks here, we would certainly have to agree that there are no false expectancies, no illusions, no bargains, no negotiations. These are the terms of following Christ and nothing less. Now, to this point, as we've looked at verses 25 through 33, I've set before you four headings just to remind you of what those are. Number one, we saw the crowd in verse 25, and we were reminded that there was a mixed crowd, a large mixed crowd following our Lord. Some were committed, most were uncommitted, and so that led to the commitment in verse 26 that Jesus requires of the large crowd how easy it would be to follow after Christ in the anonymity of a large crowd and virtually hide behind others in the crowd where there is no responsibility and no accountability. But Jesus, in verse 26, stopped, turned around, addressed those who were following, and called for a singular, exclusive, preeminent commitment to Him. Apart from this kind of a commitment, Jesus says, we cannot be his disciple. And when he says we must hate father and mother, etc., more than, than, um, than him, excuse me, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, he cannot be my disciple. He's calling for us to love him more than anything or anyone else in this world. That is the commitment, and nothing less will allow one to be a follower of Christ. And then third, we noted the cross in verse 27. He says that that we must carry our cross if we are to come after Christ. And a cross meant dying to self. A cross meant submission to a higher authority. Uh, A cross meant the surrender of one's life to the higher allegiance to Jesus Christ. That is necessary for being a disciple. And then, fourth, we noted the cost in verses 28 to 33. In these verses, there are two parables, and both deal with the cost. Now, the first parable in verses 28 to 30 deals with the cost if we do follow him, that it will cost us everything. The second parable deals with the cost if we do not follow him, that we will perish. And Jesus, represented here as a king with 20,000 soldiers, will come and utterly destroy all who do not accept his terms of peace. So that brings us now to the final heading 
that I want to set before us tonight in verses 34 and 35, and that is the caution. And Jesus has been emphasizing that his followers must be wholeheartedly devoted to him. They cannot be nominally committed to him or half committed and be one of his disciples. So our Lord now says in verse 34, Therefore, which really brings us down to a bottom line, as a result of everything that he has just said from verses 26 to 33, therefore, therefore, salt is good. And Jesus is making an analogy here that believers are to be like salt. Uh, Jesus has already said that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, you are the salt of the earth. And salt has certain qualities about it that parallel what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, Salt preserves uh, meat. It prevents deterioration. It prevents spoiling. And disciples, by our influence in the world and the presence of the Holy Spirit living within us, we are to function as preservatives, moral preservatives in this world. As long as the Christians are strong, it is a defense mechanism against the spread of evil in this world. It will spread, no doubt. But when the cause of Christianity is strong, historically, century by century, believers have been like salt and have, have retarded the spreading of illicit evil. And also, salt imparts flavor to food. It makes it enjoyable and tasty. And so believers are to be a blessing to others in the world and to be that which causes them to enjoy life even more. They may not be saved, but it's Christians who have founded hospitals and schools and, and have, have trained uh, people to be in the world and by common grace to work for the good of mankind, even if mankind remains unconverted and lost. And nevertheless, from the lives of Christians who are like salt, uh, we are to season the culture and the world around us. And by the way, uh, that is why we are to be scattered in this world. Um, I fear that sometimes as Christians, we're just always in the salt shaker. We're always with one another. And we need to be out in the world and be out rubbing shoulders with unbelievers. It's fine for our children to be protected by us and to keep them in a cloistered environment. But way too many Christians have a fort mentality of just wanting to run into the church and to have nothing to do with the world. And we are the salt of the earth. And we are to be penetrating into the world and into culture and into society and bringing the Lordship of Christ to bear upon the world around us. We are to be witnesses for Christ. And Jesus also said, we're the light of the world. And a, a, a light or a lamp is not to be hidden under a bushel, but is to shine its light into a dark world. I think each one of us should think very carefully about how can I be salt in the world? How can I um, preserve the spread of evil by my influence and by my presence and by my testimony and by my priorities and by my values? And how can I be a blessing and that will extend the goodness of God to others. So Jesus begins by saying salt is good, and where he's headed with this is that his disciples are, are like salt. But he goes on to say, but, and as soon as we see the word but, salt is good, but, we know that this is now 
headed in a different direction. There's, been a, there's a setup. But if even salt has become tasteless, for salt to become tasteless means it loses its distinctiveness. It loses its flavor. It loses its, its pungency, its potency. And it becomes flat. If even salt has become tasteless, with what, with what will it be seasoned? And the answer to that rhetorical question is, with nothing. If salt loses its tastelessness, it can never recover what it once was. There is a forfeiting um, of what it once apparently had and can no longer be regained. It will lose its taste, it will lose its flavor, and with what will it be seasoned? The answer is nothing. And so what this represents is something that, that we need to discuss. But first look at verse 35. It is useless, the salt that has lost its savor. It is useless. Now, for it to be useless means it is worthless, of zero value, of zero profit. It is entirely ineffective, unprofitable, unproductive, and good for nothing. That, that is what salt that has lost its savor is. It says, it is useless, and now Jesus says, the two least productive uses that salt could be used for, it's not even useful for that. There are many other uses that could be higher up on the ladder of profitable, profitability for the use of salt, but at the very bottom of the list are these two. And if it's not good for these two, it's certainly not good for anything else. So, he says, it is useless for the soil or for the manure pile. When it's useless for soil means it, it cannot even be used as fertilizer. Um, it, it, it has no positive benefit to be thrown, uh, sown into the soil and to function as bringing nutrients to the soil that would help fertilize and bring about the growth of what is planted in the soil. Totally useless for dirt. Dirt has no use for it. Throw it away someplace else. And then Jesus comes one step lower and says, salt that has lost its savor is even totally useless and worthless for the manure pile. Salt that is good can be good for the manure pile to retard the stench and to soften the odor but salt that has lost its savor cannot be used to, to retard the stench of, of even manure. And that's about as base and as low as it could possibly be. He says it's thrown out, and that it is thrown out means it's discarded. It is thrown away. We have no use for it. There, there's no need to even hang on to it. It is absolutely worthless and of no value whatsoever. It is to be thrown out. It has zero worth for anyone or anything. It's not even good for the dung pile, is what Jesus is saying. 
These are strong words, are they not? If this wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't be using this tonight. But Jesus is intending to be very provocative in His words. And so we would ask the question, of whom is Jesus speaking? Who, who is one who is salt that has lost its savor and is useless for the soil or for the manure pile? And the answer to that is in the context. The answer is found in verses 26 to 33. The one described in verses 34 and 35 is referenced in the previous verses, and they are those in the crowd that is following him who are half-hearted followers. They are half in, half out. They are half committed listeners, and therefore they are no commitment listeners. Half a commitment is no commitment. They are those who love father and ma mother more than Jesus. They are those who love spouse and children more than Jesus. They are those who love themselves more than the Lord Jesus Christ. They are those who do not carry their cross. And they are those who began to build, but did not count the cost, and then they stop in the midst of their following after Christ. That is who Jesus is referencing here. These are people who have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world and are trying to play all ends into the middle. They are one person on Sunday morning and someone else on Monday night. And they fit in wherever they are, and that is the problem. And they are at home with true believers, and they are at home, all too at home, with true worldlings, without feeling any tension between the two worlds. They are in the world, and they are of the world. And they use Christian jargon in conversation with believers, but they are way too at home with the compromised priorities of others. Now, the reference here is to those who are religious but lost. Now, these are those who follow in the crowd but who are not committed to Christ. That's obvious. And they are those who are not converted to Christ. Now, they are not disciples. Now, they may profess Jesus, but they do not possess Him. And these may claim Jesus as Savior, but they do not know Him as Lord. And their faith is an easy believism. They may know about Christ intellectually, but they do not know Him personally, internally, and individually. They have a fascination with Christ, but no faith in Christ. That is who is being described here, and it is an extraordinary caution that Jesus is issuing to these who would follow after Him. And in the terms with which our Lord is speaking, it is all or nothing. It is black and white, there is no gray. There is no middle road. There is no fence sitting. Uh, there is no compromise position. Uh, there is no halfway house. Uh, there is no moderating place. It is all or nothing. It is either full commitment to Christ or a false commitment to Christ. That is what Jesus is saying in unmistakable language. And that is why he says then at the end of verse 35, this, this statement that he said earlier in Luke 8, verse 8, it is like a, a proverb. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, 
the crowd could hear him audibly. They heard the words that he was saying, but what Jesus is saying, they must hear with their, with their hearts. They must hear with their inner person. What he is saying must register in the depth of their being, and they must be gripped by what he says, and they must act upon what he says. To hear and not to do is not to hear at all. And he is saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What he is saying is, you need to contemplate what I'm saying, and you need to act upon what I'm saying, or you did not hear what I said. Ears must be used to hear. They are an entrance into the mind. They must be kept open when our Lord is speaking. And they must be used to listen very closely to what Jesus says. And Jesus will not moderate what he is saying. He has said it. It must be received. This means the listener must take to heart what he is saying. And it means that the listener of these words must act decisively and positively toward what our Lord is saying, or this person cannot be my disciple. James will put it this way, that we must not merely be a hearer of the Word, but be a doer of the Word. That is precisely what our Lord is saying. And it is both a caution as well as an open invitation to respond to the words that he has just said. He wants those in the crowd to respond and to come to him by faith. So how would one know if he or she is a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, again, as we have already studied in this passage, one, could, one must consider the following questions. Number one, do I love Jesus Christ more than any earthly person? Do I love Jesus Christ more than my parents who brought me into this world? Do I love Jesus Christ more than my spouse with whom I share life? Do I love Jesus Christ more than, one, than I do my own siblings with whom I have grown up and continue to have much love and affection for? That is the first question. Do I love Jesus Christ more than any earthly person. And what this is saying is that Jesus Christ must be number one in our lives, or He will not be in our lives at all. What this is saying is He must be in the front seat behind the steering wheel, driving our lives, or He is not along for the ride at all. He will not sit in the back seat. He will not ride shotgun. He will not be in the back or in the trunk. He's either in the front seat behind the steering wheel, or he has no part of our lives whatsoever. He is a jealous God and a jealous Savior, and it is all or nothing with him. That is why we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things be added unto us. That is why Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So that's the first question, and it begs each one of us to search our own hearts. And it's not just that Jesus must be number one, we must love for Him to be number one, and we must love Him as number one in our lives. It is possible for one to submit their life to a dictator that one hates. It's possible for one to come under the authority of a, of a tyrant that one despises. You could say, well, that person is number one in my life, and my life is, 
in submission to that person, but I, I am repulsed by that person who rules over my life. No, when Jesus says here that, that we must hate his own father and mother and brother and sister and his own life, Matthew 10, 37 gives us the interpretation. It says, we must love Jesus more than anyone or anything. So as Jesus is preeminent in our lives, we love for Him to be preeminent in our lives, and we love Him as the preeminent one in our lives. And no one else ever died on a cross for me. No one ever else has carried my sins far away. No one else ever shed their blood for my sins. No one else ever reconciled me to a holy God. No one else ever satisfied God's wrath towards me by their death upon the cross. No one else is coming back from heaven for me to take me there with him. How our hearts should love the Lord Jesus Christ for the per per perfection and purity of his holiness as well as for his atoning sacrifice. That's the first question. Second, to answer this question, how would I know if I am a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ? Second, do I love Jesus Christ more than my own life? Do I love Him more than self-pleasure? Do I love Him more than self-ease? Do I love Him more than self-control? Do I love Him more than self anything and everything? That is why we must carry a cross. We must die to self that we would live for Christ. And self dies hard. But in the act of conversion, in the miracle of regeneration, we are given by the Holy Spirit a love for Jesus Christ that surpasses even the love that I have for myself. Third, do I find greatest joy in Jesus Christ? Do I find more joy in my relationship with Christ than I do in the things of this world? Does Jesus thrill my heart? Does He thrill my soul? Is He the one who causes the greatest excitement within me, the greatest enthusiasm in, in life? That's what it is to be a disciple of Christ. Fourth, do I find greatest pleasure in Christ? And to follow Him is no drudgery, it is all pleasure, for He is the greatest of all masters for us to follow. He is the greatest of all teachers for us to learn from. He is the greatest of, of all lords for us to submit to. He is the greatest of everything that is good and holy and right in our lives, and we should find greatest pleasure in Him. Fifth, am I more excited about Him than anything or anyone else in life. Sixth, have you taken up your cross and chosen to follow Christ? No one is going to heaven who has not taken up their cross to follow after Christ. No one will pass through the eye of the needle and enter into heaven one day who has not carried their cross. All believers are cross-bearers in this world. Seventh, have you surrendered your life to Him? To surrender one's life is to accept His terms of peace. It is to relinquish one's life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is to recognize that all that I am and all that I have is surrendered to the Lord Jesus. 
That is what he calls for in this passage. Eighth, is your life lived in submission to his lordship? To be in submission to the lordship of Christ means that I have yielded to him, that I have humbled myself before him, and have come under his right to rule over my life. The word submission, literally of the Greek language, hypotasso, means to line up under, and it's a military term, as uh, a lesser in an army in the first century would come under the authority of a superior who now has the right to issue orders and to issue direction what one is to do as they find themselves in this army. This is what the word submission means. It means to line up under the sovereign authority of Jesus Christ. And so the question is, is your life lived in submission to the Lordship of Christ? Number nine, have you counted the cost to follow Him? The cost factor is great. The cost factor is enormous. Now, there are no good works that I must do to pay a price for the forgiveness of my sins. Jesus paid it all at the cross in his death. He paid the fullness of the penalty for my sin. In my hands, no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Yet, in submitting my life to Christ, I must recognize that now there are the demands of discipleship as I pass through the narrow gate. The narrow gate leads down a narrow path. It never leads to easy street. It will cost us so much, the control of my life, my reputation. It may cost me persecution. It may cost me resistance and loss of friends. It will cost me... um, much as I follow after Christ, but I do want to say again, for everything that we give up, it comes back to us 100-fold, both in this life and in the life to come. And finally, tenth, have you transferred the ownership of all your possessions to Him? That is what he requires in verse 33. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. This does not mean that we have to buy our way into heaven. Neither does it mean that we have to liquidate everything that we have and give it all away until we have absolutely nothing in order to be a disciple. What this does mean is that there must be the transfer of ownership of all that is entrusted to me, and it all now is under the management of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are but stewards who are entrusted with our master's possessions, but they're not my possessions. They are in the the possession of the head of the house, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am to use them as He would direct me to use them. And it's more than just possessions. It also refers to my gifts, my ability, my time, as well as all of my resources. That is why I began this message by saying to be a disciple of Christ is serious business. It does lead to joy, So it doesn't lead to sadness, it leads to joy, but it is a serious proposition. I dare say none of us have ever been called upon to make a commitment at this high a level to anyone else or anything else we've ever been a part of, even in the military, even in playing for athletics, for Uh, a demanding coach, even in trying to learn how to play a musical instrument that would require so much of you. This is the preeminent commitment that is required across the board in our lives, and there is no area of our lives that are not involved in this type of following after Christ. It's 24-7. 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, every area of my life, there is no part that is outside the parameters of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you've never made this commitment, I would urge you to do so tonight. I would urge you to do so, but I would urge you to count the cost so that your commitment would be a genuine commitment that you would not begin to build but be half-finished. Most of us here tonight, I will assume, have made such a decision, and as we study our Bible, we are learning more and more of what is required of me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And tonight, for those of us who are disciples of Christ, we have bought in. We have signed the dotted line. We have signed up for this. This should be a, a, a reminder to us of that to which we have agreed to, that my life needs to be continually being brought back into alignment with this fundamental commitment and preeminent surrender of my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be primary. He must be preeminent. He must be first. He must be foremost. He must be everything. He must be the alpha and the omega of our lives and everything in between. He must be the first. He must be the last. He must be the entirety of our lives. What a joy it is for us to have the words of our Lord recorded in Scripture and to come down through the centuries and to be placed before us as it has been tonight, as though we were standing in that crowd 2,000 years ago. You say, "This this is more than I can do. And the answer is yes, it is only by the inward power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. God at work within us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. It is a work of grace within our hearts that conquers our once proud hearts and draws us to be ever yielding our lives to the Lordship of Christ. Be encouraged to know that is a work of God within you. Left to yourself, none of us would live this way. Left to ourselves, we're we're too proud, we're too self-centered, we're too self-sufficient in our own flesh. It is only by a work of God's Spirit that we would be able to respond to an invitation like this and to accept the terms by which Christ sets before us that are, that are so demanding. So as we have looked at this, and should you feel tonight, I'm intimidated by this, I'm overwhelmed by this, I would say that's good. You understand the, the, the magnitude of what is being set before us by our Lord. But let us also be encouraged that not only does He call us to Himself, but He also is so at work within His own people that He enables us to day by day live like this in ongoing surrender to Him. And when our commitments are varied and pulled from one side to the other, He is so good to convict us of our sin. And in order that we might confess and repent and to come back to this kind of a commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so tonight, as I would bring this to conclusion, let each of us say in our heart to the Lord, Lord, be at work within me to to bring about this ongoing response in my heart towards you. Let us say, I don't want to, to live in a substandard way. Certainly it could be said, if if we are genuinely saved, but we lose some sense of the saltiness of our testimony and of our lives, 
then we are worthless. We are useless. And ultimately, it would mean that one is not a genuine disciple at all, which is to be not a genuine believer at all. So let us, as I bring this study to conclusion that we've looked at for the last three weeks, let us consider what our Lord is requiring of us. And it is good for us to periodically have these hard sayings of Christ sift through our hearts and to be reminded of what it is that He demands in our lives and from our lives. May we respond by the sweet surrender and submission and say, Lord Jesus, I do want to follow you on your terms. I do want to live out my life as a true disciple. Give me yet more grace. Give me more submission. Crush my proud heart. Bring me into greater alignment to this which you call for. Let's close in prayer. Father, these words are so huge. They just loom in our Bibles before us. They require full surrender, full submission, full allegiance and loyalty to Christ. And Lord, we ask of You to be so at work within us that in our sanctification as we grow into Christ's likeness, that You would be bringing about greater, fuller, richer, deeper realities of this initial commitment to follow after You. Lord, we can only imagine how this must have thinned out the crowd 2,000 years ago. And it certainly sifts through our hearts here tonight. Help us to be sold out. Help us to be entirely Yours. Lord, if our soul is an altar, we want to place our heart, our mind, our will, our everything on the altar within us and yield it all up to you. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.